All right, take your Bible tonight, turn to Ecclesiastes chapter number 3 tonight. We're doing part 2 on He hath made all things beautiful in His time. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and we talked last week about the beauty of God's uh, timing there in verse number 11. He hath made everything beautiful in His time, the Bible says. And we talked about God's timing. And we noted two things last week. God's timing provides daily bread, provision for our lives. And then we talked about how God's timing provides direction in our life. He shows us what to to do and where to go right when we need to know where to go and what to do. So now we're going to pick up where we left off. We're going to see next God's timing provides deliverance when it is His will. So let's pray. Father, bless the message now. Help us to glean the wonderful truths in this passage. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. At the age of 23, when George Washington was battling with the English to drive out the French and the Indians, God's hand of protection was upon Washington. The colonials, they fought like the Indians. But the British, in their bright red uniforms, they fought out in the open and considered it cowardly to hide behind a tree. Uh, When General Braddock of the British was shot, the British lost courage and they ran. Well, Washington rallied those men to fight. His first horse was shot out from beneath him during the battle. His second horse was shot out beneath him again. So he got on a third horse. Imagine if those horses could talk, they'd be saying, don't you dare get on me. So he got on a third horse and he kept fighting with bullets blazing everywhere in that battle. In fact, Washington wrote, he said, By the all-powerful dispensations of providence, I have been protected beyond all human probability or expectation. For I had four bullets go through my coat. Two horses shot out from under me, yet I escaped unhurt although death was leveling my companions on every side of me. You know, when I read that, I said, man, look what God did for that man. God protected Washington so that he could exalt him and use him later on to be the first president and the father of the United States of America. You know, all throughout the Bible, we find that God makes all things beautiful in his time as he delivered those who were either in danger or in need. We saw in 1 Kings 19, Elijah was depressed. He wanted to die, didn't want to live anymore. So the Bible says an angel touched him and fed him, bringing him strength when he desperately needed it in his life. In 1 Samuel 23, we find David was surrounded by King Saul who was moving in for the kill when all of a sudden Saul withdrew his troops because of a Philistine attack in another region. God's timing was perfect and David was spared by the the clutches of Saul. Beloved, he makes all things beautiful in his time. Uh, We saw in Acts chapter 12, on the eve of his execution, Peter was delivered and set free by an angel of the Lord. We saw uh, in Jonah chapter 1, in spite of his disobedience, God had a fish ready to go, prepared to deliver Jonah. Uh, when he was thrown overboard into the sea. The fish delivered Jonah from drowning by swallowing him. 
And then the fish, that well, transported Jonah to the place where God had commanded him to go. He got a free ride in the belly of the well. I don't know if I would be real thrilled about that. I know Jonah wasn't. But you know what? God made sure he got, got him to where he was supposed to be. You know, in Daniel chapter number 3, these men would not bow to an idol even though their lives were on the line when they were thrown into the fiery furnace. The Lord delivered them and miraculously spared their lives by walking with them through the fire. Beloved, he makes all things beautiful in his time. Uh, in, in Daniel chapter 6, Daniel continued to pray to the Lord in spite of the law that was passed forbidding prayer when he was thrown into the lion's den. God miraculously spared his life by shutting the mouths of those very hungry lions. The Lord came through at the right time, at the right place, making everything beautiful for Daniel. See, beloved, God's timing provides deliverance when it is his will for our life. We find in Genesis 45, God used the suffering, the slavery, and the imprisonment of Joseph uh, to put him into a position to interpret the dreams of a butler <clears throat> and a ba baker. And several years later, he interpreted the dreams of the Pharaoh himself. Joseph was promoted by Pharaoh and was used to save Egypt the surrounding nations, and his own family who came for food in a terrible time of famine. God had his man at the right place for the right time, making everything beautiful. God provides deliverance in his own time. Uh, in Genesis 22, God told Abraham to offer his son as a sacrifice to the Lord. And at the last moment, he told Abraham to stop. He was testing Abraham. And when Abraham passed that test, God provided a ram in the thicket for a sacrifice. Isaac was spared, and Abraham proved his love for God, which resulted in a huge blessing from the Lord. In Exodus 14, when the Jews were oppressed in slavery, Moses was raised up from the wilderness to proclaim to the Pharaoh, Let my people go. He said this with courage. He said this with confidence. You know what? If you had the Lord backing you up, you'd say it with courage and confidence too. By the way, we're to have that courage and confidence today because God is backing us up just like he did Moses. Well, there was steel in the words of Moses because he was commissioned by the great I Am. See, God's timing was on time. After they departed from Egypt, the Egyptian army had the Jews cornered at the Red Sea. There was no place to go. When it looked like uh, they would close in for a massacre, God put on the brakes and protected his people by a pillar of fire. And then he opened the Red Sea so they could escape right across it. When the Egyptians followed them, at the right moment, God closed the sea upon them and baptized them, but he didn't let them come up for air. God protected them and provided for their needs. But wait a minute. In Judges chapter 5, Barak and his army and Deborah went to fight the Midianites. And God disarmed the Midianite chariots at the crucial moment with heavy rains and an earthquake. This led to a victory for Israel. We find in Exodus chapter number 2, Pharaoh was killing the baby boys of Egypt. The mother of Moses put him in an ark on the Nile River in order to save her baby's life. 
God directed that ark to the princess of Egypt, the daughter of the man who was killing the babies. God's going to have the last laugh in this story. She had compassion, not contempt, for baby Moses. And she reared Moses as her own son. Moses' mother ended up being a nurse for her son. She got paid for doing it. You know, God is awesome, isn't he? You know, he makes everything beautiful in his own time and in his own way. You know, we find in Ex Esther chapter number 6, on the eve of Mordecai's execution by Haman, the king had insomnia that night. And he ha just happened to read in the exact place where Mordecai, the guy who's supposed to be executed, where Mordecai saved his life. He was honored by the king, and the plans and the ideas for honoring Mordecai and their implementation ended up being done by Haman, the man who tried to destroy him. God has a great sense of humor, and his timing is perfect and on schedule. In Genesis chapter 19, Lot was delivered from the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. When Lot was clear of the danger, then the cities were destroyed. God provided for his needs. He does his he does all things beautiful. He makes all things beautiful in his time. You know, I think about Pastor Tom Rakow. One day his phone jingled. One of his members was having an emergency surgery for gallstones. Rakow sighed and resigned himself to making the hospital trip through snow and over the icy roads of Minnesota. His feeling of dread and weariness deepened. On his way home after the visit, he saw a car that got stuck in a snowbank. And he pulled alongside to see if he could help. A man was sitting on the passenger side, and the vehicle's engine was running. The man lowered his, his window, and Tom approached the car. Uh, the man spoke in, in, in wheezes. He said, my, my wife was bringing me back from the, the hospital and hit a slick spot. Someone stopped and, and she's gone to help get a record to pull the car out. Well, Tom asked, he said, well, do you mind if I wait with you till the wrecker comes? And the man welcomed the company. And Tom slid behind the steering wheel of that car. The man whose name was John explained that he was suffering from cancer in his chest. And immediately Tom knew that he and John were not, not sitting together in that car by a mere coincidence. This was a divine appointment. A question surfaced in his mind, and at first he tried to suppress it. But then, sensing great urgency, he asked John, he said, John, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? And John looked at him straight in the eyes, and with great difficulty, he said, I've been trying to find God, but I don't know how. Tom explained the gospel simply and quietly. And then he read to this man, John 5, 24, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Well, that man prayed and trusted Jesus Christ as his Savior. Then he grabbed Pastor Tom's hand, and he said, 
I've been waiting for you for a long time. I wonder how many people are waiting for us to give them the same message. Well, folks, John died about a, a month later. And Pastor Rakow later wrote, he says, I can't help but marvel how God used cancer, frigid, snowy weather, slick roads, breathing problems, and gallstones to accomplish his plan. But he did. God fused and knitted those factors together in order to bring John to the Lord Jesus Christ. See, beloved, he makes everything beautiful <laughs> in his time. Now, we've seen two areas so far in Ecclesiastes 3. We saw the burden of life's toil and benefits, our question. We saw that. We saw the beauty of God's time. But now we're going to see a third thing tonight. It's in Ecclesiastes 3. It's at the latter part of verse 11. We see the birth of boundlessness in men. Look at verse 3, the latter part. He hath set the world in their heart. This is a rich passage here. When the Lord created man, he birthed in the soul of man the awareness and existence of life beyond death. Man was made aware of eternity and that there was something more beyond this life. This is seen in the phrase, God set, or He gave, or He put the world in man's heart. Now, the word world is a very interesting word. It comes from the Hebrew word olam, which means this. Here's what it means. It means everlasting, eternity, or continuous existence. When the Lord made us, He made us eternal beings. He put eternity in our hearts. Mankind has been given understanding that there is something beyond the grave. We have a curiosity about the future and what is going to happen Tomorrow, we know there is something else down the road beyond the grave. And boy, if anybody knows that, a Christian knows that, because it's all laid out for us in the Scripture. The future is why folks, including unsaved people, have an interest in Bible prophecy. They are curious what the Bible says about the future. We were made by the Lord to live forever with Him, which in turn gives multitudes a craving, a longing, a desire for a life with God that will never end. See, He who is finite, that is us, was created with a desire to seek Him who is infinite. That's the Lord. In fact, Augustine said, Thou hast made us for thyself, and our hearts are restless until they learn to rest in thee. God made us to be with him in eternity. But man's sins have broken fellowship with the Lord. His sin has caused him to seek satisfaction in his heart somewhere else but to no avail. The breach between God and men had to be mended for the fellowship to be restored. See, men today have their own ideas on how to mend the breach and achieve eternal life, which includes good works or worshiping false gods. God 
however, solved the sin problem and has made the path of restoration with him. He's made it very simple. See, man's ways are complicated, but not God's way. He's made it simple. It's so simple that a little child can understand it. Everlasting life is not something you achieve or gain by your works. It is a gift that is received by trusting in Jesus Christ for eternal salvation. God promises this to anyone who puts his faith in Jesus Christ. We are saved by his wonderful grace and mercy. Paul said in Titus 3, 5, he said, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Thank God for that. We are cleansed by being born again. And the Holy Spirit makes us new creatures in Jesus Christ. John 3, 36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Oh my, don't underestimate the wrath of God, folks. Uh, the Bible says in John 6, 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. 1 John 5, 13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. God wants us to know we're going to heaven. He wants us to know that. And we can know that by trusting Christ as our Savior. Because eternity and a desire for God has been set or planted in our hearts, nothing in this world or in this life, including achievements, including awards or accomplishments, those things are not going to quench our restlessness and our need for satisfaction. There will still be emptiness within our heart no matter what we accomplish in our life. People may find temporary pleasure or satisfaction in things, but the desire for peace in their soul still boils and bubbles over. God planned it that way. We are made with desire that only the Lord Jesus Christ can fulfill. That's the way God designed us. If things or experiences satisfied us and filled the void of our empty hearts, then we would see no need for God in our lives because something else is satisfying us. See, the Lord wants us to realize that He is the only one that can fill our need for satisfaction, for peace, contentment, happiness, and joy in our life. Now, some seek for peace by turning to drugs. They'll turn to liquor. They'll turn to sinful pleasures or religious deeds, but to no avail. The dread of death hangs over the unsaved sinner because the issue of eternity lingers in his soul. Denying or rejecting life after death and judgment to come will not do any good. You can say it doesn't exist at all, but it's not going to change the thing. It's not going to change the matter that the truth of God still exists and the truth of God still reigns. See, eternity has been branded into the, the conscience, the heart, the soul of men. Thomas Watson, the Puritan pastor, put it this way. He said this, Eternity to the godly is a day that has no sunset. Oh, I like that. Eternity to the wicked is a night that has no sunrise. Rel restlessness in the soul will not be calmed until a person puts his or her faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God for salvation.
And when that happens, God gives peace to that person. You can sleep at night. You can go to bed. By being prepared for death, a person is prepared for life each day. Through Christ's salvation, the relationship with God has been healed. Broken fellowship with God caused by sin is restored by faith in the Savior. Paul said in Romans 5, 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm so thankful that when I'm going, going down the road, I can still fellowship with the Lord and talk with Him and pray with Him. I can do that in the car. I can do it in the house. I can do it hiking through the woods. I can do it walking down the aisles of Walmart. Amen. I can talk to the Lord because I have fellowship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith in Christ prepares a person for life in eternity. In fact, it creates a thirst and a desire to be with God and fellowship with Him face to face. How many of you, just even over the last year, said, Lord, I just, I just wish you'd come today. How many of you have done that? Huh? I've been praying that. My wife's been praying that. You know, uh, Lord, just come and get us out of here, you know. Paul spoke about the desire to be with the Lord in Philippians 1.23. He said, for I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Titus 2.13 says, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't know. I, I, I dare say there are millions of Christians today that are longing for His coming, longing for Him to come, and longing just to see Him. You know, it was David's faith in God that gave him satisfaction as well as a longing for God that he loved dearly. I love what David wrote in Psalm 63. He said this. He said, O God, Thou art my God. Early will I seek Thee. My soul thirsteth for Thee. My flesh longeth for Thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. To see thy power and thy glory. So as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Oh, because thy loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise thee. Just like Becky did tonight. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness. And my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. Man, what a powerful passage. C.S. Lewis expressed his longing for God in heaven when he said this. He said, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. <laughs> if none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, that does not prove that the universe is a fraud. Probably earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it, but only to arouse it, to suggest the real thing. The desire and yearning that were in his heart, he described as the scent of a flower we have not found, the echo of of a tune we have not heard and news from a country 
we have never yet visited. God has put the fragrance of heaven into the heart of mankind so that he will long to be with the Lord. The yearning for heaven will not, however, be quenched or satisfied outside of Jesus Christ. That longing can only be satisfied by a personal relationship with the Savior. The Bible says that Jesus is the Alpha and Omega. That means he is the A and Z of life. Everything that we need is found in him from A to Z. That is what he was saying. I am everything. I'm the Alpha, I'm the beginning, and guess what? I'm the end too. I'm everything you need. Beloved, isn't it wonderful that he has made all things wonderful in his time?